I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like Live right here on Black Power Media. I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be with you once again. Greetings, Grand Rising, Hotep, Habarigani, Jambo, Peace, Asalaamu Alaikum, Saludos, all of that good stuff. Uh, and welcome again, everybody, and including welcome to Jazzy Heathen. That is a great name uh, as a new member. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the group. Welcome to the club. Welcome to the family. Uh, and we encourage uh, that uh, others join you in supporting our growing uh, collective and uh Media movement. No, that's a <laughs> uh, we have a very special guest joining us in just a minute, in a few minutes, actually. Uh, um, after I just take care of a couple things and get to one piece just to get it out of the way before we move on to, to more uh, uh, substantive discussions. Uh, but I want to, uh, uh, in addition to welcoming everybody, um, uh, I want to uh, very quickly remind everybody and alert everybody that we are now on Spotify and will be soon on your other favorite podcasting platforms uh, here very shortly. Uh, this show, I Mix What I Like, the Remix Morning Show, uh, and uh, I believe Riot Starter and others are being have already been moved and others are being moved. So if that is something that you find of value and will be helpful to you, please, uh, you know, make note of that. Um, and uh, sign up there as well. Um, please. Uh, also encourage people to join us here this morning. Like Ear Doctor says, tell a friend, tell a friend, to tell a friend, to tell a friend, and come on in. Uh, follow us on all of that relevant social media. Greetings, everybody. Hope you all had a had a, a, a very good and productive and safe and healthy weekend. Uh, of course, the full remix morning show, giving you your more complete and well-rounded Boom Bat Breakfast will be here tomorrow morning and throughout the week as well. Uh, and uh, and then, of course, I'll be back on Friday with uh, Brother Kaba and uh, nothing, I think, scheduled just yet on that front. But um, OK, but in a minute. So we're going to get to this discussion with Lawrence Grand Prix about the color of money uh, by Marissa Baradaran, who I did reach out to and I have heard from on this uh, issue. Uh, so we'll talk more about that as well. Uh, and what may even be my loving, subtle, slight disagreement with Brother Lawrence. I don't know. We'll have to see. Maybe I don't even understand fully, but I look forward to the conversation nonetheless. And by the way, this is something that I very much look forward to, uh, have always in my broadcasting efforts over the years, and certainly here, have wanted to make space to expand the range of discussion, even debate. So, and uh, where there is disagreement to have it. Um, so uh, I love that that would be going on and uh, uh, would encourage more to do that. I mean, we can't always get everything right and we're not always gonna be on the same page and so be it. Uh, and where there is disagreement, we should be able to, 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 to clarify that and discuss it. Um, what else? All right, so let me get to this, this, this piece here real quick on, um, because there has been some more on, uh, uh, well, first of all, first of all, 
I know the United States came, you know, beat Mexico, and I know everybody's been paying attention to this in the World Cup qualifiers. And there's, there, but I, but I have to make a quick note of this. I did watch the match. Uh, I mentioned the other day I had my Panama shirt on, and of course, I completely, I, I, I do this all the time, forget to even make the points that I intend to make when I'm doing something. Uh, but I had my Panama shirt on. Panama had played uh, um, that same day as well uh, against Nicaragua. And that game was off the chain. Shout out to my Panamanian f- crew and family uh, for coming back down 2-0, 75 minutes into the match. And scored three goals in those closing 15 minutes. That is crazy. I don't even know what the odds would be on that. It was an incredible close. Panama comes back and win. U.S. plays Mexico. I saw that too. Mexico lost. Uh, U.S. won two to nothing, or as they like to say, dos a cero, and in a very condescending way. And I cannot help but notice in in world football what is happening in this country, the United States, uh, that is much like the dominant popular sports in this country. Almost all of the players are black or brown and almost all of the fans are white and specifically white and affluent. Traditionally, when you watch American soccer, U.S. soccer, the team is mostly white. And and as people know, one of the reasons is, is, of course, that soccer in this country is extremely expensive, extremely exclusive uh, and often very white and affluent. So so, you know, uh, uh, so so. But obviously, as teams and people want to get better, they expand the reach. So you have a whole bunch of, you know, well, a several and increasing number of half, you know, Mexican U.S. nationals who who choose the U.S. when they probably could have gone to Mexico and played as well. Uh, And a whole bunch of 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 black people. I mean, it was beautiful in that on the starting 11 and throughout the entire match, there were only two white players on the u.s side at any given time out of 11 which i thought was amazing i i I, in in terms of soccer is unheard of so i thought that was very interesting something just to keep note of and of course they won uh coach white fans white players mostly black so it's starting to look like they're trying to get as serious with the soccer as they are with all the other sports (laughs) All right, so that's one thing. All right, um, and more, more to to uh, um, so that's Eddie. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, a couple of other just very quick points here. A couple, uh, a couple of the quick issues. It was sent to me. Forgive me for not remembering. I can't remember who sent this to me. Uh, was it Kichi motivator? I can't even remember. Uh, Doctor Hate maybe. Um, but just something, cause you know, I, I didn't really get into it this much for this week cause we had too much other stuff going on, but, uh, I just, again, think it's fascinating that as many people are trying to tell us that, that crypto is the, the, the new revolutionary alternative, uh, these things keep happening, you know, uh, um, uh, just one billionaire makes one statement, one move and the whole currency goes wherever. So as per Bloomberg uh, Billionaire Index, Tesla CEO Elon Musk's personal net worth has been dwindled by a staggering $35 billion in just one day. This is the equivalent to the entire market cap of the meme cryptocurrency Dogecoin. The Musk-supported cryptocurrency is currently trading uh, at $0.27 cents on major spot exchanges. Um, so it, it's just it's just shows the 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 volatility of this uh uh and in this other story that was related to it i'll just pull this up very quickly as well um the same the same piece here but uh it's actually the exact same story 
Uh, much is made unrealized gain. Da, 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 da. So I propose selling 10% of the stock. Let's see. Within 48 hours, the cent to billionaire's wealth has plunged by $50 billion, which exceeds the entire network of Len Blavatnik, the richest man in the UK. Len Blavatnik, by the way, is the, uh, ex, is it Axided Access Industries or Allied Industries is also, the, among many other things, the owner of, I believe still, of Warner Music Group. Uh, and, and for at least for a long time, if not still. Um, because it was one of the points that I used to make all the time when people were talking about, you know, they were saying the same thing about music that is now being said about cryptocurrency. That is uh, similar to that announcement that we talked about earlier, where, where, where Tory Lanez is saying that he's broken the music industry by selling his album as an NFT. Um, it was that same kind of thing. Music now, now that we can sell it directly to the consumer and we can go online and we don't need the industries, we can, we can take over, we can make money now, we can, you know, uh, 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 you know, fund our communities and do all these other things now because we can do what the music industry prevented us from doing. Uh, well, Len Blavatnik was one of the the the, the several uh, examples as to why this was not a reality as Warner Music and others rearranged uh, the music industry in the digital world. Uh, took over many of the 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 platforms, made arrangements with all these other play, iTunes, Pandora, et cetera, and so forth, to make sure that their music dominates uh, all for the political purposes that I've been outlining and arguing for years that go beyond just economic. Um, uh, where, in fact, Warner Music was, I think, like one percent or two percent of his overall operation. Um, anyway, so just anyway. Um, and so, I, so anyway, I didn't, I'm not, I don't mean to, anyway, there was a lot more to it. Uh, uh, and I'm rushing through that part of admittedly. Um, but, but so actually I'm not even sure. Were they saying that, let me scratch that. Were they saying that, 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 that Dogecoin dropped in value because of his, or was they, were they just pointing out anyway, uh, I'll come back to that. But, 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 uh, um, uh, okay. Now, this was just sent to me, uh, and I have not followed up on this one either. Uh, I'm rushing through these to get to one thing I did follow up on, but uh, before we get to our guest. But um, police discover the body of a 70 year old black, 72 year old black woman hanging from a tree uh, here in Maryland. Um, the body of a 70 year, 72 year old black woman was found hanging from a tree in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, Wednesday. Uh, so this would have been about a week and a half ago. Uh, unattended death discovered at 730 in the morning. Uh, preliminary investigation reveals the incident does not appear to be criminal in nature. Uh, although the investigators do not suspect foul play, one community activist isn't sure. Carl Snowden took to his Facebook page to give public more detailed information concerning the victim. His post revealed that the older woman was black. Tick tock, tick tock. Annapolis police officers just took down the deceased body of an African American woman. The unidentified woman was found hanging from a tree in Annapolis. Well, so I'm, I'll be interested in following up on this if there's more information that comes. Uh, if, if indeed it does turn out to be something, I'm not sure. You know, anyway, so, and if anybody else knows anything about this, please, uh, you know, let us know. Or as we, you know, um, the last recording lynching in the state was George Armwood in 1933. 40 lynchings documented in Maryland's history. That seems low, but anyway, um, so I hope uh, uh, that gets appropriately dealt. Okay, so real quick, um, before we do get to our guest, this is uh more akin to, to to uh what i you know unfortunately just continue to pay attention to here um it feels like increasingly i've been arguing for years that 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 it's it's that this this buying power mythology is targeted specifically and in a particular way to black america and i'm starting to feel like latin america is starting to 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 suffer the same particularities. Again, I get the Google alerts on this literally every day. And most of it is, again, buying power being assessed among, for every element of 
society's demographics from municipalities to corporations to entire federal governments to uh um uh you know left-handed affluent white girls between 13 and 16 you know classify you know i mean you know i mean they get very specific they're all over the place but but and and almost never are they are they you know targeting this kind of um in this communities in this kind of way because they're not targeting specifically targeted colonized communities but when it does come to these colonized communities uh less so even with indigenous people uh but but with latin americans and obviously with black people this is kind of what they're saying. So same thing with more than one and a half trillion dollars in buying power on the line, brands must understand what, what matters most to the Hispanic and Latinx community. We must note that this is coming out in ad week, one of the leading advertising industry periodicals. Uh, and is, is just, again, on the one hand, conflating ec actual economic strength with the ability to spend money on selected, what are made available goods owned by other people and the corporations who are able to spend the ad revenue that that black and now brown advertiser uh, uh, commercial media want to cap capture. And then, of course, they do the same thing. In fact, the Selig Center for Economic Growth calculated that the U.S. Hispanic purchasing power sat at one and a half trillion in 2019, and it's only grown since. So it's, again, the same reference to the same Selig Center. Again, I have continuously shown how those numbers have nothing to do with ac actual economic data uh and they are in their own described as um estimates and projections uh and then are often misinterpreted to mean something entirely different uh when picked up by these black and brown presses that and and others that want to promote uh and encourage a particular distribution of ad purchasing OK. Um, and it's the same thing uh, again in, in, in this other recent. Coming right back to specifically target the black community, understanding the multicultural audience can strengthen your business strategy. And again, what gets rebranded and reprinted and redirected at us as actual economic analysis and data is is again misinterpreted often intentionally by the journalists and, and the journalists who are trying to capture that ad, re ad revenue by promoting an affluence that doesn't exist uh what they ignore is that this is a a, a, a business strategy for ad buyers all right um so you have people like Dr. Brand, Brandel Mills Cox, who is the director of communications and uh, um, uh, for inclusive market research group uh, and Bernalillo County District Attorney's Office, who uh, wants to help explain why white advertisers need to respect a more diverse and multicultural audience and then spend their their revenue accordingly the urgency of multicultural marketing across 21 of 25 major u.s markets 84 percent of consumers are multicultural this equates to 4.3 trillion in consumer buying power again this is sort of my point this is an assessment of and i haven't gone into this particular uh article to 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 break this down to to but my point here is that they're assessing a $4.3 trillion buying power to 84% of these 20, 21 major U.S. markets who they say are multicultural. All to help c corporations spend their ad revenue, not to assess the economic condition of these communities. Okay, that was the same one. And that's actually the the and that's it. We can stop there. Let's let's move on so we can get to our guests. But that's 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 essentially the point that keeps getting lost as these articles keep coming out and keep being misinterpreted and rebranded and then used by hustlers 
to to uh, uh, falsely present themselves as Pied Pipers, uh, as revolutionary Pied Pipers leading black people economically to a brighter day uh, if we were just more financially literate. All right. All right, let's move on. Let's get to the let's get to the business of the morning uh and uh and talk with our next guest about uh Marissa Baradaron's The Color of Money. Um and and uh yeah, and, and have this discussion back here in just a quick second. I mix what I like, 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 what I like. What I like, what I like, what I like. All right, everybody. Our next guest is, among many other things, a director of research for Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. Again, an organization based in Baltimore uh, that I highly uh, recommend engaging, supporting, building with, debating, discussing, uh, making part and parcel of uh, your media and political diets to people to get, if not at a minimum, you know, just in terms of attention, more fully involved with in terms of their work uh, and an organization I've supported for a long time. Uh, Lawrence Grand Prix uh, has authored uh, a review of Marissa Baradaran's The Color of Money, which is a book that I have used and recommended and written about uh, for a long time now. Uh, and already in the show notes to this episode are the links to Lawrence's piece and to previous interviews that I've done uh, with Marissa herself. Um, but with no further ado, let's bring Lawrence up to the screen. Welcome you to the program, good sir. And let's get to it. Good morning. How you doing, Jared? I'm as good as could be expected, my man. And, Great. And very happy to be joined again by you. Uh, and very interested in what you have uh, put together here that I want to pull up here very quickly uh, from good your Goodreads review, which again is linked below. And I encourage people to read in full for themselves. But I just wanted to to just, just start with what I've highlighted here, and then have you lay out what you said, and then raise a couple questions, and we'll go we'll go from there if that's all right. Okay. Um, uh, simply put, you've written here that, that what you found in her work was some good info on the limits of black banking and a surprising, poorly formed pro-integrationist attack on black nationalism and black independent political action, which I think is your main thrust and thesis here. Uh, so please break that down and 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 let's let's get into it. How is how is her book poorly formed and a pro-integrationist attack on black nationalism and black independent political action? So my argument is that you have to understand how these texts circulate within the academy and our larger information economy. Nowhere in the book does Marissa say, I don't like black nationalism. I don't think black people can be free or should be free. But when you take the text in its totality, a person who has an expertise on one part of black issues, black banking, and who gives a lot of good information that I concede is quite good on black banking. I don't know if it's because of her editor saying, I want this to be a trade book, but she opines wildly, in my opinion, about black political strategy, black political history, black figures. And she does not show a requisite expertise on the history around these figures and around these decisions that her book is wildly opining on. So when she's talking specifically about black banks, I think that analysis is pretty good. But for some reason, she makes broad sweeping arguments about the nature of black movements, about black political strategy, about uh, black capitalism being this nefarious trick Nixon pulled on black people that diffused the movement. And there are multiple moments in the book that I think pretty clearly show severe scholarly limitations. And when taken in its totality, it's almost like a Jedi mind trick, where the good information about black banks, I think, makes people less precise about questioning the fundamental meta-level argument she's making in the book literally concludes the only hope we have is integration, you know? Um, and when you are having these like constant subtle slights at, you know, black political decision-making, black figures all throughout history, kind of using their support for black banks as some sort of, you know, not just a limitation of their times and limitation and context, but some sort of fundamental proof 
of the assumptions of integration being fundamentally the only solution for Black people, the totality of the book serves within the context of this academic discourse as the way attacks work, in my opinion today, is not to say Black nationalism is stupid, Pan-Africanism is stupid, it's to say it's not a serious political strategy. And that is the solution. I think it's very easy to come away from reading this book that folks may have had good intentions, folks may have had good hearts, but you can't really take this notion of Black independence, Black nationalism seriously because of the nature of Black banks and the limitations of dollar circulation theory, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you haven't done the work to prove that argument. There's a whole lot of context that's missing. And again, these are wild opinings, in my opinion, that don't have the requisite nuance to be seen as anything other than an attempt to delegitimize Black nationalism and Black independent institution building, in my opinion. So I mean, my first reaction to reading what you said here was, was you know, kind of like, well, yeah, but I mean, why would we expect that from this book? I mean, this is, you know, she's not, uh, uh, and I did reach out to her and invited uh, uh, her to to check out today's show and to respond as she likes. Um, and and without going into and, and, you know, reading her private messages, she did say something that, that, that or raised a couple issues that I, that I think I agree with, Lawrence, that for instance, her audience is not black communities. It's not black radical communities. Her intent here is to not mm -hmm. explain the history of black politics or even black nationalist radical traditions. She's she is this book is written to a New York Times white audience and it's written to uh, 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 policymakers who yeah. she hopes would would. <laughs> um, in some small way, revisit, as she says here, because to your point, I mean, like I was looking back at even some of the notes I had written when I, you know, from my readings and one, I wasn't reading it for the same reasons uh, with the same lens, I think that you brought to it, but, but, you know, even in my, my, some of my notes here, she's saying, like she says, uh, uh, in other words, to make America great again, we should look at the redistributive government programs that made America great during the post-war era and emulate them in a more inclusive way. And I wrote like a big X and what in the margins. And I'm saying like, because my whole thing is like, when was America <laughs> great during the post-war era and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. And I've, even as I've said to her, like she takes, she takes like a, a, a little swipe at communism. Uh, you know, I, you know, I made the, the joke like this is how you this is how you're going to get away with your argument because you, you're you know, you're making a pro capitalist anti communist. You're not it's not like and she's she's I mean, she's cool with that. So so my point is, is isn't it best that we just take it for what it's worth, that it is good information. And for those of us who want to be critics of black capitalism, mm -hmm. that we would say here is a, a non revolutionary mainstream look at how traditions from across the board because she does include some reference to black radicals who were critical of black banking that 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 is she's just saying look black banking as it's currently constructed doesn't work so why wouldn't we anyway let me yeah let you so the fact that it's written for the new york times audience for me supercharges my critique of it the fact that mm -hmm. it's written for policymakers again supercharges my critique of it um do you want me to do a screen share and share my presentation i don't know if we have time to get through all of it but Sure. You know, I mean, we have. We're, this is your show today, man. So take your time, man. Let's go. Okay. Because yeah, I did have a presentation. Because again, I just want to kind of share. Because I came yeah. to it kind of under the assumptions you just had, and I kind of expected it to not be, you know, what I would expect it to be. But I just felt like it was so flagrant. Some of the mm. mistakes in the book that I've seen nobody call out, and I just need to talk about it because right. <laughs> this book to me crosses the line of yeah. I expect it to be limited in terms of what it can bring, but the fact that it is being seen by policymakers, the fact that it is being seen as context for these decisions, to me, proves why it's so important to have this conversation, because I think you're going to take away from it some some assumptions that I think just aren't quite true, <laughs> you know, so I'm going to okay. have to skip around a little bit, but but let, let's just start here, man. Let's just start here. So point one, integration as the only solution. So this is the conclusion of the book. This is, this is, 2017, correct? This book was in 2017 published, correct? Uh, yeah, I'll double check. I'll double check. So this is two yeah, years, I believe two entire years and some months after the Baltimore uprising. Mm -hmm. But look how she describes the Baltimore uprising, which, spoiler alert, it's not how I would describe the Baltimore uprising. 
So I'll just read this. The following year, Baltimore exploded. A Harvard study found that Baltimore was the nation's worst city with respect to childhood poverty. A lack of economic opportunity was also one of the most segregated cities in the country. In 2015, Baltimore was the scene of another uprising. What began as a peaceful protest, point one, turned to a violence when looters rooted a CVS and destroyed a police vehicle, part two. <laughs> Student fires and also downtown business area, part three. It is regrettable what's happening now, says Reverend Jesse Jackson told the Baltimore Sun, part four, they're <laughs> looking for an action of cynical and hopelessness. Governor Larry Hogan declared the state's emergency and about 5,000 state and local national law enforcement officers sending on the city, quickly putting a ride to an end. <laughs> what's wrong? Every single statement there was wrong. I'm sorry, Marissa, but you had two years to figure this out. So you have to talk to people about the Baltimore uprising. So you know that... <laughs> It was not started with a peaceful protest. Students wanted to get home from school. There was a meme share that says, we're going to purge. Yeah, man. Claiming a riot, which some people claim was a false flag, but at worst seemed to be just people being angry about the funeral. So students were trapped at the bus, at the subway station at um, Mondawmin Mall, students from Frederick Douglass High School. They could not get on the subway because police were blocking the subway. That means they had to walk home through the area on North Avenue, where Freddie Gray's family was, and people's were in the Gilmore Homes area. And Lawrence, I, I forgive this. Forgive this one interruption, or not one, but one of what will be many. I'm sure. Unfortunately, I apologize. But but I want to just highlight that that to your point, there's a long history of this being a problem. This specific issue you're talking about yeah. with the kids coming home from school, with the Mondom and bus situation with the police coming on buses harassing kids so so i just want to re- re- remind or a- alert people that to what, what you're even talking about as incorrect a- a- as being incorrectly summarized by 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 Baradaran is mm-hmm. is even worse in terms of this this extended history that all these kids know about and have known about and experienced exactly. okay sorry please go so ahead. again it wasn't a peaceful protest it was kids trying to come home that's right they only rioted and looted because the police were provoking them. That's right. Right? Why are you citing Jesse Jackson two years after the incident? This feels like what, what you write when it happened four months before you publish. But this was two yeah. years before she published. And the rioting of violence was not centered in downtown. It was largely centered around like the Gilmore Homes area. And they broke some windows downtown. It was not fire in the downtown business area. It was setting fire to a few cars and breaking some windows. And the violence was over long before Larry Hogan sent in those five thousand troops. Well, there was that. There was that one moment uh, during uh, the aftermath of an of an Orioles baseball game where where, if I remember correctly, white fans were confronted with some hostile crowds, and that that point was extrapolated to mean as you as you're you're saying here. Uh, uh, fires engulfed the downtown business area. Yeah, and that and was I, a week before yeah. the incident she's talking right, about. Right, and that's anyone, right. And that's what I mean. It's like, I'm just a brother from Baltimore. I'm not an Ivy League re- researcher with a book deal. But but this is designed to fit some narrative. And the point I want to make here is that she's claiming it's because of segregation. Now, I would argue on two critical points, you could argue integration for the exacerbated the dynamics that lead to this. Remember, when they integrated Baltimore City Public Schools, it wasn't just giving access to the elite city and poly. It was also improving Frederick Douglass High School, the historic black school. But that demand to improve Frederick Douglass went by the wayside when they integrated people in the city and poly. Mm-hmm. So now Frederick Douglass is no longer an elite black school. It's a struggling black school that does not have the resources to help young people be able to navigate these types of situations. Secondly, Sandtown mm-hmm. Winchester was a target, not just of disinvestment from segregation, like Marissa's talking about. It was a target of a hundred million dollar federal investment program in the 90s, which helped shred the community, mm-hmm. which helped cherry pick people out of the community. And then they brought in the police to protect their investment. So I would argue you cannot understand Sandtown Winchester through the lens of segregation and disinvestment. It was the nature of investment that she's calling for as her solution that helped destroy that community. And this is what we are missing. Well, to be fair, just to be fair to what she says, just to be fair to what she says, she says that the policies of the past need to be done in a better way. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, we can get to the, the, I fundamentally question, I mean, this gets to my whole argument about woke technocracy, that if we have these larger institutional apparatuses of social, of essentially, you know, the liberal nonprofit industrial complex, it's literally her solution. So I'll just go to that now. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, she claims that- and Take your time, man. You don't have to rush through it. Take your time. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I always put in too much, right? 
But yeah, but I'm not I'm not making this up. She does say integration should be the center of the solution. This is literally the last paragraph in her book. Modernity will inevitably bring us closer, which can lead to either greater resentment or greater cooperation. But have more people will realize that what benefits the minority will also benefit the majority. Full racial integration will eventually remove pockets of black crime and deprivation across the country. This will advance the entire American population. Integrated schools will improve education for all students and will increase equity and will spur economic growth. We must shed the destructive myth that separate can be equal, that a segregated economy reach prosperity on its own, and that Black banks can lead to Black prosperity without fundamental economic change. We can deflect the responsibility of economic equity onto Black communities. We cannot deflect the responsibility of economic equity on Black communities alone. W.B. Du Bois declared that in 1948 that the problem of American democracy was that we have not tried it. Perhaps this is time, it is time to try so I don't disagree with this statement per se, but the entire rest of the book is challenging the argument that I make, which is that in the, and Harold Cruz makes and other folks make, is that independent black institutions are a prerequisite to be able to leverage, to be able to, so that when these investments happen, they happen in ways that actually feed our institutions as opposed to destroy them, right? And so what does she so, claim as so, a solution? Wait, 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 before you leave that page, Go back to that slide, please, because 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 this this point I'm very familiar with in her work. And, and I remember uh, consciously in my own uh, um, engagement, deciding to not. These were the the the, the um, inducements to rabbit holes that I, I avoided because I was being very singularly focused. But. To 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 be fair to what I think is 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 her one of her points that i took very and i take very much to be correct is that the claim that black people in segregation can economically do better is what drives the the mythology of black capitalism and is itself false mm -hmm. so so it's not to say so now this is where in my own people misread my own argument I'm not saying let's integrate for the sake of being around whites so that we can blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. I'm trying to make the point economically that the claim that black. So when she's saying a segregated economy mm -hmm. cannot work, she is correct. Yes. So, so now, so, and that's where, anyway, so, so she's yeah, not I, going my, to. My question is okay, that the book ahead. makes it feel like that many of these folks advocating for independent black institutions made it seem like that argument was synonymous with excluding larger, more redistributive policies. It also begs the question of what we count as redistributive and what we don't count as redistributive, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, mm -hmm. I think you have to not see all money as good money. So for example, like this is part of what she phrases as one of her only concrete solutions in the book is the Georgetown reparations program. So for folks who don't know, Georgetown is basically trying to find the descendants of the slaves that they sold and offer them free tuition as reparations. <laughs> like, again, and this is... This I don't mean to laugh. This is the way you say it. It's so but, but this is what she says is her definition of the inevitable integration raising the votes. This is like Kanye West's level of arrogance to think that Georgetown has what descendants of slaves need to rise up and overcome. And again, I didn't write her book. She put this in the book. So if you're comparing that to like the shade she throws at minority set asides, this is at least as ridiculous, right? So, but we, but wait, but but wait, when you say the shade she throws at minority set asides, what do you mean, and why do you say it's shady, and why do you say it's wrong? Be okay, so so you asking and, me to skip to the end of the presentation? Right, my bad. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean. My, okay, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Go ahead, take your time. I'll come back to it. Go ahead. Okay, but yeah, I always put too much stuff in the presentations, but I'm just trying to figure out what I can include in the time we have and then what's a little bit more um, in depth, right? So, all right, so I'll, I'll just go here to blaming the victim, right? So this is one of the nut quite central paragraphs that also made me question the context of the book, right? So, I mean, I'll just read it. Um, by linking large white corporations with aspiring black businessmen, the race cohesion, the rage that the Panthers had channeled and amplified was dissipated. This in turn removed the incentive for businesses to participate in Black capitalism. Black capital was also cannibalized by the budget of the war on poverty. The OEO budget was successively cut and siphoned off to OMBE programs. The war on poverty, which was designated to help core of all races was instead being diverted to help aspiring black entrepreneurs, isolating the black community from yet another source of strengths, the interracial collective action of the poor, and an expert 
on political detente, detente used black capitalism to let just enough steam from the pent up pressure cooker of rage and poverty stricken ghettos to clutch the brewing revolution. Ultimately, the black capitalism was anemic and utterly unresponsive to the needs of the black community, but it was vague enough to offer just enough hope needed to cool the boiling anger that was just about to spill over. With this one move, Nixon took the sting out of the black radicals' demand for black power. Jefferson Johnson's anti-poverty programs maintained his opposition to integration and even won support of many black leaders. Checkmate. So I feel like this is completely out of context. I feel like assigning the failure of the war on poverty largely to black capitalism ignores the fundamental questions of like racial neoliberalism, of white backlash independent to black capitalism, of fundamental questions of austerity, Vietnam War, and especially like COINTELPRO and the co-option of the nonprofit industrial complex. Like, but wait, 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 wait. Don't leave that point. Because I'm I, this is where it. I, because, well, this is, I'm sorry, I said it again. Oh, I was just about to expand upon it with my next point. Well, yeah, but yeah, I don't yeah, want you to go too far because this is where I think I don't agree with you. Th because because how how is hers is not the broader context of of assessing. I think, at least from a, 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 certainly a radical or an accurate enough position, the conditions of the, of the black community historically, or the black radical struggle, or the black political struggle, or the black liberation movement, the freedom movement. She is she is making a point specifically. Again, this is why I I enjoyed using it and and think it makes a good point. This is this is how I used it. That the context that I think you and I share is supported by what she's is talking about here. She's not going to write about that context. She's not going to talk about COINTELPRO, imperialism, austerity, the, the nonprofit you know component of all this. She's make she's trying to make a specific point about black capitalism and black. And this is what Nixon was doing. Mm -hmm. This is what Nixon's intent was to 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 give black people this black capitalist approach, knowing it can't work to, to siphon yeah. off the radical. OK, so so. No, I, I, I don't agree that this is one form of developmental separatism. That is an argument to essentially reform black political energies into a specific context. And again, the fact that she says she's not talking about the nonprofit industrial complex is my point, that she's explicitly claiming that as part of uh, her solution. And all the literature, Robert but the Allen, nonprofit, Karen but no, Ferguson. no, but even Nixon's, yeah, yeah, but even that nonprofit, I get it, but the nonprofit assault that Nixon helped usher in was part of the broader attempt to offer non radical solutions similar to black capitalist solutions that mm -hmm. are non solutions to, 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 to yeah. siphon off. And, and my radical... argument is that when she frames the argument as multiracial organizing around redistributive policies. That assumes that something has fundamentally changed about the nonprofit industrial complex. I would argue the exact opposite is true. It is still developmental separatism. It is still a fundamental attack on Black communities that makes them handmaidens to capital. And the fact that she doesn't implicate her solution when the, even the scholarships she is citing would seem that it would be necessary to explicitly implicate the things that she's okay. calling for as part of now, that developmental separatism is my critique. Okay, I get that. But on this issue here that's on the screen here, I don't see this as blaming the victim and I don't see that what she's written here is incorrect. I get to now your point that you're going yeah, to uh, my argument is, is that, that she ascribes okay. this as the core of what diffused the pressure cooker. That's my well, argument. This is one part of many things that help quote-unquote diffuse the pressure cooker, including the violent fist of COINTELPRO that Correct. made people think I better start a business or I might get shot. So I never had to face that choice. So I don't want to ascribe any sort of negative moral okay. question to an individual who chose to like start a business because they saw their friends being killed. But my argument is that Marissa Broderon has not shown to me that she has been engrossed enough in the history scholarship suffering of black people. She to isn't. Make claim. So that's she what I mean. She, so she's not qualified but, but, to make the claim. But I don't. Opinion. But I also don't see her saying that black people who wanted to start a business were silly. In, in, infantile or, oh, yeah. or whatever. But, but, but She's saying not, they weren't induced the to that. The nature of the attack functions. The nature of but, the attack is to almost frame it like a noble savage type thing. Where it's like, oh, they had such good intentions. If only things could have worked out well. Because what it does is that it makes it harder for us to actually interrogate what they did, learn the good parts of it, dissect the bad parts from it, and improve upon it. 
it, it produces okay. this veneer of tragedy around the whole thing, this white liberal emotional veneer of tragedy, which makes it harder for us to actually interrogate these policies seriously and improve upon them. And that's also okay. implicating her so-called con uh, conclusion. Because again, if we aren't seriously interrogating like the criticisms folks had of you know, why they would choose to do a, a set of a, 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 a minority contract or as opposed to take a grant from the Ford Foundation. Like that was a decision We're, made in many cases to pick that path. And we are, we are, and this book doesn't give us a notion that we need to take that question seriously. And that's the my only thing. With it. I, I, I don't doubt that you're correct. I'm just saying that, but her point is that, that black people were induced and uh, uh, tricked and encouraged uh, uh, to it, to believe in entrepreneurialism and banking as a solution, and and when when it was always understood to not be one, so she, I, I, okay, so yeah, so I guess what I'm saying is that if we take a basic argument, and as a matter of fact, now I'll just skip ahead to what kind of I used as the um flashy part of my post, right? That at a basic argument, the way the book is written, it's, again, to me, it's this sort of tragedy narrative that makes it feel like even the best laid plans of coming up against this buzzsaw of segregation, which I think denigrates the possibility of Black folks having independent Black political and economic organizations, not as an economically liberatory strategy in and of themselves, but to have a base point for independent Black organization to be able to push back against the terms of interracial organizing, to push back against the terms of reinvestment. And when you have this, like I said, these incredible blank spots about black capacity, it makes it feel like that's not worth talking about. So let me just read this paragraph, because this is what blew my mind. This is what made me write the piece. So she's writing about an argument that she basically concludes with it's worth listening to slash she believes in, that there's an analogy to be made about segregating black folks in a segregated black economy decreases the demand for black business people because they don't, there's no demand for them because they're not in the larger economy. So the analogy she uses is baseball. And this is what she writes. Or the analogy she cites is a white guy writing about baseball, which is what she writes, quote, Cross used black athletes as an example. He explained that there had always been a strong supply of black boxers because there had long been a demand for them. Again, until 1945, there had been a rampant discrimination in other sports like baseball and football, and thus there was no market demand for black players in those sports, which produced no black athletes until the 1960s. Once there was a demand for black athletes, came to dominate those sports in much greater numbers than their proportion of the population. This did not come about because black people are stronger or more agile than whites. Certainly did not occur. They were suddenly instituted training programs for black athletes. It was not necessary. When the demand opened up, the supply grew. So she's arguing that because she's signing a white guy who's talking about baseball, among other sports, and says that because white people didn't demand black baseball players, she's concluding that black people didn't produce great baseball players until integration. This is insanity. Because it's ignored. It just, just, just to be clear, just to be fair, hold on, hold on. But Lawrence, just to be fair, when I don't read it quite in that same way. She's saying there's no demand for black ball players by the major leagues. I don't read her as saying, saying that, there were... that that means they didn't produce great ball players until I, there was. Again, I, I would have to go back and read that section of the book, but in the clip you just read right there, you showed right there. I don't interpret this 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 shot right here until to be 1945. Saying... There have been rampant mm -hmm. discrimination in other sports like baseball and football, and thus there was no market demand for black players in those sports, which produced no black athletes until the 1960s. Okay, I understand that that's poorly phrased and written, but I'm saying I still don't take that to mean <laughs> that, that the argument is that there was no quality black players being produced for the Negro Leagues or elsewhere. What it's saying is there was no well, yeah, market well, demand for black players in those white Garrett, major leagues I which produced no Marissa black athletes. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> which produced no black athletes until the 1960s. Uh, no black athletes, Garrett. No black athletes. No black no no black. Days. Hold no on, Joe Lawrence, Rogan. Lawrence. That's not what I. Again, that's not how I'm interpreting with this 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 clip. I'm interpreting again. I will go back and read I'm, the whole it's section. Right there. But I'm, <laughs> what I'm saying, what Lawrence, what I'm reading here, what you keep saying, it's right there. What I'm saying is right there is is something else. And what what I'm saying is right there is that there's no production of black athletes for the major leagues. 
I don't I don't read that. And maybe that's because I do know about the Negro Leagues and the broader history. But I don't take that to mean that that they're trying to argue that yeah. they're arguing that there was no demand in the major leagues. Be, uh, 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 therefore, there were no players. There were no athletes until the 1960s when there was a demand. It wasn't that there were no that they had to create those athletes out of nothing. In I fact, he even saying. says it. I, hold on. Even at the end of this quote here, he's even saying it. It's the, the change did not occur because <laughs> oh, we right. suddenly instituted training programs. Yeah, but so it also saying, says that when hold on, hold on, more on, hold on, hold on, my man, you got to let me finish. He's not saying that the, that they automatically they all of a sudden created training programs and therefore there was abundance of black qualified athletes. He's saying all of a sudden there was a demand and now we found them. Because yes. they were and they were already there. It's not that. Yes. Anyway, Listen, but Jared, go ahead. can I respond, please? Please, let's, go let's ahead. focus on the conclusion. When the demand opened up, the supply grew, and when we study the Negro Leagues and the fact that they were demolished by integration, we know this is not true. The opposite happened. That when the demand opened up, the supply shrank, because the traditional Negro League teams were decimated by integration. Wait a minute, Lawrence. Again, the supply for the major leagues grew. Yeah, that and did, that's my that's, point, that they don't care right. about the actual supply of black players, period. That no, was no, what he's, to black independent institutions. That's again, what I care about, I, right? No, you care it, about the Negro Leagues. He doesn't. No, no, I care so, about black people getting opportunity, which No, obviously, I'm not, I'm not talking about the broader point. I'm In this issue, in this context, you care about the Negro Leagues, not Major League Baseball. He doesn't care about the Negro Leagues. He only cares about Major League Baseball. So he's saying that the demand for Major League black ball players opened up, the supply grew. Now, for them, that that was a quote positive in that that more black people were in the major leagues, black players dominated the leagues, et cetera, and so forth. From your point, and I would agree, this meant nothing good for the black, for the majority of other black players and owners not all of whom were black in the Negro leagues, but, but the Negro leagues itself did not, was not going to survive. I I fully agree with that. I don't, but that I don't think is what is being said here. Yeah. So I probably and, need to expand the quote because either way, I think this argument needs to be central because she's making the argument partially in the context of like town, like, you know, talent development being having integrated markets critical to that. And again, the entire history of the Negro leagues fundamentally just proves that argument. I know Marissa knows the Negro Leagues exist because Jackie Robinson had a black bank. But Jackie Robinson also talked a lot of shit about the Negro Leagues, right? So Jackie Robinson talking shit about the Negro Leagues makes people feel like the Negro Leagues were just janky, irrelevant, poorly run, and not relevant to this conversation. So that's what I'm, that, this is my argument, is that the fact that you don't take it as the Negro Leagues, as an independent black institution formed during segregation, as a counterpoint to your argument about the degenerate black Negro economy, it doesn't even come up in the book. Like, I think this is the context of the argument that makes it so I, frustrating. Right? I, I don't, I don't, all right. Well, I don't think we agree on that. And I'd also, we, I also think we need to come back to this. To what extent are the Negro Leagues an independent black institution? I mean, that's a whole yeah. other thing. No, I mean, they I mean, weren't. Yeah, all they had mafia money. They needed white. And, I mean, it was, they had white owners and all the kinds of stuff. So, I mean, it was. Yeah, it's, but it's, not all of them. Anyway. Yeah, I'm not, not I'm just saying, but, but, as, but then, but as an institution, I'm just, so anyway, but go ahead. Keep yeah. Going. Okay. Um. So, yeah. So, I'll just conclude with what she said about minority set aside, because this is the point that I was getting to, right? So she's making the argument that minority set asides are, you know, I'll just read it. If the focus remained relentlessly on small businesses in 1969, Section 8A of the Small Businesses Act authorized the SBA to manage a program to coordinate government agencies in allocating a certain number of contracts to minority small businesses, referred to as procurement or contract set asides. Moynihan, and again, she identifies it with Moynihan, helped shape the program. In 1971, the SBA had allocated $66 million in federal contracts to minority firms, making it the most robust federal aid to minority businesses. Still, the total contracts given to minority firms accounted to one-tenth of one percent of the $76 billion in total federal contracts that year. The program was not without controversy. Minority set-asides immediately faced backlash from blue-collar workers, white construction firms, and conservatives who called it preferential treatment for minorities. Moreover, multiple studies revealed that 20% of these set-asides had gone to white-owned firms, which like in 1973, an amendment that specifically stated the businesses did not be owned by minorities. Unsurprisingly, it was revealed that Nixon used these set-asides to bestow political favors, a frustrated SBA employee claiming the agency's main purpose was political. This charge was accurate and could be extended to cover the entirety of the Black capitalism framework. Right. So again, it's not that minority set-asides are terrible. It's just like, again, this notion of them as 
you know, I, 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 maybe a good attempt, but fundamentally flawed. And the fact that she associates it with Moynihan, to me, obfuscates the role of folks like Perrin Mitchell, who helped pass that 73 Amendment, right? And what I'm arguing is that, like, there is solid scholarship that, like, I'll just bring it up because, people, you know, well, so let's just let's just talk about this idea that it was fundamentally antithetical. The black construction independent contractors were antithetical to other forms of organizing. Of course, black independent construction contractors largely come about because of the nature of racism in the unions, which David C. O. Goldberg's book, Black Power at Work, helped points out. In Detroit, black construction contractors were part of a larger coalition, including the Black Panthers, to fundamentally push back against the constrictions of the business sector and include demands to deal with the limitations of things like black banking to have more comprehensive vision of justice. Now, I think this is the type of thing that should be included in this sort of analysis. Moreover, David wait a minute. I'm Frank sorry. Flower, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're saying you're saying Mitchell's argument or your argument is that Mitchell was an example of how black banking could have a more social justice. No, no, I, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 just give me a few minutes to finish up my. my okay, my bad. All right, I, all right. Yeah. So I, just give me a few minutes, and then we can have the discussion in a larger context. I, I just wasn't sure what you said. So yeah, I just yeah, to yeah. No, I got go it. Ahead. It'll go make ahead. more sense when I finish. So David Blanchflower at Dartmouth did one of the very few studies I've seen this cited like four times in all of academia. Go to Google Scholar, look it up. That says that in studies that most vigorously implemented minority set asides. Black business creation increased dramatically, right? So this is the graph, black business creation increases. Now, this is the critical point. This is what also drew me to write this text, is that Karen Parker at Delaware argues that you cannot understand the African-American crime drop and murder drop of the 90s without seeing that cities that had more black business creation had higher rates of decline in black murders. Because with all the limitations of black businesses, we have empirical evidence that shows they're more likely to hire working class black men who are adjacent to the street economy. So what we have here is an evidence-based strategy, not to make just make black people rich, even though that might be part of it and deserves critique. But part of what also happens is that by employing working class black men, working class black people killed each other less. And this is a civilizational infrastructure that is not perfect, but working class black people say to me, man, things were better in the 80s. It wasn't perfect, but at least you could get a construction job. Now the brothers are going to the corner because they ain't got nothing. And me, as a critic of black capitalism, I ignored this argument for years until I went back and did the research and saw there was actual empirical evidence to prove what those folks were saying. So we don't. But have I don't even to... agree. I, wait a minute. I don't agree. I think I disagree with a lot of what you're saying here. That's why I was asking you to slow down a second ago because you're saying a lot that I'm not sure I'm hearing correctly, and I'm definitely not sure I'm agreeing with. Okay. Because I'm hearing because because what I'm hearing you say just now is that we need that that minority set asides help black businesses, which help reduce black on black violence. I'm not saying that the fact okay, that I'm not I, saying I, that. Okay. <laughs> and people from the community. The argument you're presenting, Lawrence, yeah. based on the work of these academics, is that minority set asides increase black businesses, increase black hiring, reduce black violence. Right? Am I hearing that correctly? Okay. Um, but I think, and then you're saying that previously, as a critic of black capitalism, you missed this point, and 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 this is where I was predicting we were going to end up disagreeing. As I read your initial Goodreads argument, minority set asides or the redistribution of GDP or the redistribution of the wealth in this society is what helped reduce the violence. The black capitalist element is irrelevant. For instance, Mayor Marion Barry in D.C. during mm -hmm. my upbringing, that is the classic example, got brothers jobs over the summer. That alone was said. Now, that that isn't black capitalism. That's federal or state municipal policy, which is what I'm saying is what we need if we're going to. Now, this is where I, now my own argument gets misunderstood. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not offering an integrationist democratic argument. I'm saying we need political power. We don't need black capitalism. No, How we I get agree. that political power. So that's my that's so what you're describing here is political power, not business. It's not at black capitalism that benefited anything here. It's a redistribution of society's wealth back to these communities uh, um, th and, and would not need the business component. I don't think the business component proves yeah, your point. Okay, it's I that got people you. have a job. Okay. They have I resources. You. I got you. 
So this is, goes back to something Davon talks about and gets to my criticism of the nonprofit industrial complex, which I think has been glossed over in this conversation. We as I'm trying to figure out what is the actual mechanism of what that job would be and what we control what that job would do. Because this gets to my criticism of things like job guarantees, right? Because if we don't control what the job guarantee goes to, they're going to do things like build a maglev train from D.C. to Baltimore, which is going to be an engine of gentrification, right? So if we, so like you say, like we need to have like independent black political power being able to leverage these multiracial coalitions for the political reinvestment you're talking about. And right now, what we have is people in dire need, and we need something that can actually be able to produce nodes of Black independent power, a la folks like Arrow Cruz talk about, to build the political capacity to put pressure on interracial coalitions. Like, again, Perry Mitchell was funded by the Black contractors, right? And again, as a socialist, he had to deal with his difficulty with capitalism and the needs of people in his district. He would take the train home every day and hear people say, hey, I'm struggling. Hey, I need a job. And as a socialist, he had to recognize, okay, what I can do in this moment is produce possibilities for reinvestment that deal with these immediate needs to be able to get folks a space of political uh, possibility to push for larger redistributive policy, but also have independent Black political power that can make that redistribution function in our interest. Because what I fear is that you're right. Broad-scale reinvestment would lead to more jobs, but there will be jobs in a nonprofit industrial complex, which I think is just as violent as the market. Like when I see what happens with drug treatment programs where they run like prisons, when I see what happens with like what is being funded with the Build Back Better plan that has largely been called multiracial working class reinvestment. Again, it's like ho-humming and the critique is that it's not big enough by most on the left, the Build Back Better plan. My critique is different. My critique is that without fundamental nodes of independent black political power to push back against these forms of reinvestment, we have another form of developmental separatism that makes black folks an appendage of capitalism and power, which is again, not just my argument, it's Karen Ferguson's argument, it's a lot of black radicals argument, and it's a lot of black radicals who are critical of both my, black capitalism and the nonprofit industrial complex. So the fact that this book is being sent to lawmakers, they read it, they say, okay, let's do Build Back Better, because that's the form of multiracial, class-based political intervention that she's talking about, and that now, might be serious our stuff like whatever. Right now, this is where I think I'm back on 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 the Lawrence train because this was my problem uh, with with and very with the what I think is the very uh, contradictory or maybe it's not so much now with with your with your um, review, uh, but I was initially saying that when 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 Maris is you know doing Karen Hunter and one bank one United Bank stuff that she's contradicting her own work. But mm -hmm. but to a certain extent, maybe you're arguing that she's not. Uh, um, but, you know, yeah. so, and so I'll you know, conclude yeah. here because no, take like, your time, man. We're good. This, no, this is the last slide. Now, I appreciate you being patient. This is what we get now, which is BS. So this is exactly what Marissa is critiquing. This is the billion dollar bipartisan transportation bill that has some money on the set aside for the minority business development agency. That is exactly what she's critiquing. I also question that. Right. Because that is like for show, developmental separatism. But my argument is that this is not inherently what that has to be. That if Black radicals were willing to put more pressure on the establishment, we could get more mandatory investments in Black folks having the ability to build up our own communities. That was the demand of the 60s. Racism made us burn it down. You're going to pay us to rebuild it. And that's what united some of the independent Black contractors with some of the more radicals in the community. Now, of course, that demand was going to get pushed aside. Of course, that demand was going to get co-opted. But it doesn't mean that demand isn't worth studying and taking seriously. Because, again, if the alternative is this and the Build Back Better Human Infrastructure Bill, then what we're going to have is, again, multiracial coalitions led by the unions, led by the nonprofit industrial complex, led by Bloomberg. And they're going to be the only people in our community that have the ability to make, give people jobs. So what I'm saying is that we need a diversity of strategies. And right now, what we have is this, which is no strategy at all. It's no mandatory investment in any Black institutional capacity to build anything at all. And we have Build Back Better, which maybe we should come back and talk about that separately, because I think that that bill is, you know, just a huge, huge handout to the nonprofit industrial complex to do exactly the forms of developmental separatism that Marissa is correctly critiquing Black capitalists for doing. 
So by having her conclusion be the Georgetown nonprofit industrial complex integration argument, by concluding with its flowing integrationist language, by being limited to the artifacts of the academy, as opposed to a more nuanced integration with black history and institution building, including things like the Negro Leagues. I think that this book, the fact that it goes to the New York Times audience and the policymakers is exactly why I think I have to question it. Because they don't have to take seriously fundamental questions of community control over any of this money. And to the extent that they do, they say, well, I don't want to put it in construction because that's black capitalism. I'm going to put it in Build Back Better, which, again, is just an integrationist, nonprofit industrial complex, Bloomberg, public health tyranny designed as liberation for folks like me. So, again, I think part of the argument that maybe is missing is that, frankly, if I had to pick an enemy, <laughs> I would pick the black construction contractors over the nonprofit industrial complex over Bloomberg and the forces behind the Build Back Better bill. And the fact that that is not part of the argument, it's the fundamental core of my critique, that we're left without the full landscape of the political consequences of our investment decisions, which, again, is why I brought up the uprising. You can't understand the uprising without it's the nature of the investment that helped destroy that community. Now, what she would say is, well, that was Clinton. I don't like Clinton. I want to do better than Clinton. But the assumptive logic behind what she's bringing to the table, integration is good, is the exact same assumptive logic behind what Clinton did. It may not include the get tough on crime rhetoric. It may include drug treatment. But if you know drug treatment, drug treatment is <laughs> criminalization. Drug treatment is violence against black bodies. But you're not talking about investing in black independent institutions to do that drug treatment. You're not talking about investing in black independent institutions as part of any of this. So what we're going to get is a modified version of what Clinton did, claiming to be anti-Clinton, but doing the exact same violence that caused the actual Baltimore uprising. What she sees is caused by segregation, which I see is largely caused by integration. And we're just going to do the exact same thing that caused the problem, right? So that's again, why But what she say, again, uh, at least as I interpret her work, she's not talking about integration in the same way you are. She's saying that a segregated economy is 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 not going to work. So so she's not saying, exactly. but anyway. But, that's but, my argument, Jared. It's that she's saying that in the meat of her scholarly text, the way the book is interpreted, by that conclusion I read you, is a larger pro-integration argument. Yeah, I get like, that. To me, I get I'm talking that. about the political work that the book is yeah. doing, not the specific parts of it. Well, yeah, I, she can, you know, claim yeah. to get around the criticism with some specificity, right? No, I think you, 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 you yeah. And that, and again, I, again, just personally, I was not looking at the text for for the politics. I was looking at it for the specifics on the history of blank black yeah. banking. And the funny thing is, I wasn't um, either. <laughs> I, that what drew me to the text was but, the fact that she was citing it and other folks were citing mm -hmm. it. I wasn't expecting this big political conversation, but that's why I wanted to talk about it because the subtle, insidious work of oh, bringing in yeah. political concepts into you know, I feel like it shouldn't have been a trade book, it should have been an academic book because I would have liked an academic book just on black banking and the stuff she focused on there. But the fact that it had to be a trade book, the fact that the publishing industry, I believe, is like really adamant about forcing the integrationist conclusion into the way these books are framed brings it into this larger debate that I think it should have at least been way no, more uh, engaging. Well, no book with your frame is going to be a New York Times bestseller and get the author invited to work with any presidential administration. So, or the World Bank. So, yeah, no, I got or you. the World Bank. So I get it. I mean, I'm not, I mean, again, she's not coming out of the political circles we come out of. She's not, this is not, that's not her lane. So I, I, you know, that's why I was laughing, even when from the first time we met, that you know, you you took a shot at communism, and that's going to make your book become a hit, uh, no matter whatever people might interpret it as, as actually saying. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and she's it's, not offering a critique of capitalism, and it's so, frustrating you know, because mm -hmm. I've met people. I, <laughs> the only things they might read about minority set sides are what's in this book. The only things they might read about, I mean, even like Booker T. Washington and Garvey are in this book. You know, and she does. Well, I mean, with... yeah, well, I and mean... so it, that's why it's so important to push back against the ways that these tropes of, yeah. you know, are circulated in the mainstream economy. Because, again, my argument is just a basic argument for political balance and strategy that we can't just focus on the integration multiracial option. We need to be able to hold those folks accountable. Like, again, part of it is the world that we see as LBS working with a lot of folks who are like foundation funded activists that are basically making this argument for the multiracial movement, but the solutions they talk about just are so limited in their scope. You know, there's a discussion about like black folks doing the green stuff now, green activism. 
And one of the things they tend not to talk about is property rights, like the property rights for green technologies, like transitioning those to developing countries as a form of climate reparations. They don't talk about that because one of the biggest reasons they're funding green activism, including black people in green activist spaces, is to protect their property rights to the solar panel patents, uh, patents to the wind power patents, and make developing world purchase that. And if we can't have the sort of actual multiracial organizing from a foundation integrationist framework, we need black independent pan-Africanist folks to be like, hey, Africa was screwed over by climate change. You don't, you don't deserve those property rights. But without hey, Michael Moore did state, a whole. We, we can't leverage that activism to do that. The multiracial. But they're not. But again, Marissa. But Marissa and now and these folks are not writing black organizational tool books. They're not writing to black organizations or communities. They're not. I know. So so but they're writing to so, funders. You know, Michael, of course. So Michael Moore, uh, 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 executive produces the documentary "Planet of the Humans" that exposes the whole non the whole uh, uh, climate industry as fraudulent mm -hmm. and he seems to not even exist in white left spaces anymore either by the way mm -hmm. uh so you know so there is a lot of money behind let's move people politically off of politics and to the green and you know world well, yeah, well not uh, off of because politics. it's still it's to reframe you know the, no it is to me off of politics no, yes. it's off of politics. When, you, when you're telling people we got to do this environmental thing and it's all run through fossil fuel supported green technologies and, yeah. and industries, you're moving people off of politics, at least exactly. that's my and, and, and that's um, what's in the um, the Build Back Better plan, which I, I imagine Marissa would have so, to support as, you know, so, at least the well, beginning I mean, of her alternative being manifested. And it's it's all of, again, these tax breaks for green companies. But again, again, her vision of the organizing that again she's threatened the funders that funders want to fund is because they read stuff like this and they say oh that's what worked right and so, I, I, can't, so, I can't stress how much i hear things like that in my everyday life talking to folks who are in the nonprofit industrial complex it's books like this that help really make it harder for folks who actually have black independent politics to get any space in the discourse at all which is why i wanted to write this piece so so how do you because i've gotten a version of this uh, i have to assume and well i know lbs has how do you avoid your own criticism uh or avoid your own uh, uh, yourself being accused of integrationist tendencies by engaging people by encouraging black engagement in policy um yeah uh because uh, I, you know, a lot of, a lot of black nationalists will say, why do I want to engage in any of that? Why are you telling me to engage Annapolis in the mm -hmm. state and, and, uh, local politicians and national politicians for that matter? How is that less integrationist than what, what Baradaran and Build Back Better is arguing? Yeah. You can't be neutral on a moving train. So if that's a massive integrationist agenda funded by government policy, your decisions are to fundamentally intervene in that government policy to create nodes of spaces for more independent Black political organizing and power, or to just ignore it and let them have their way. That's not to mean that there's no perfectly pure space of Black independent power. We're in America. We're on stolen land. you know. But the question is, when you see something like Build Back Better, when you see something like, again, they wanting to build this maglev train and calling that like a working class job solution for Black people, you have to be able to say, how am I going to build the capacity to be able to protect my community from that violence that's coming, right? So that's what I mean is that some folks chose to have independent capacity as an LLC. I don't judge people by the legal status that they operate in. I judge people by the work they do. So you can call yourself a co-op and be cooperating with capitalism. You can call yourself communist and be, you know, midwifing white power. You can call yourself an LLC and sell out black people. But we need to have recognition that there is costs and benefits to every form of organizing strategy. And we need to at least study the possibilities of having things like, like we are an LLC. We get a lot of our money from the hundreds of people that give us money every month. So we're not dependent on foundations. Now, if we're doing something and it's a, and they want to fund us to do what we're already going to do, then we'll just take, we'll take money because we're not, we're not promising them anything. Right. But yeah, that is a limitation of what we can do and be pure. But I'd like to be able to pay people what they're worth. I'd like to be able to give actual capacity because this work is difficult and expensive. 
right? So it doesn't mean we're caking up and getting tons of money. That means that we have a diversified economic stream. It's not dependent on any particular stream. So no one can totally cut our money off. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I'd love to be. So. So. But I'm not just talking about the right? money part. I, I'm also talking about the the, the politics part. Um, yeah. I Because mean, a lot of because a lot of the nationalists that would say that, well, you're talking about integration because you're talking about policy and this, that and the third um, are themselves engaged in black capitalist or pro capitalist endeavors that they claim yeah. are going to be revolutionary. So what I'm but what I'm saying is. So, so like just, just even politically, this idea that you're trying to achieve political power, uh, how does that, how, how, I'm just kind of curious how you argue that that isn't integration. Um, yeah, well, it's yeah. power within not America quite as it is, but you're using the institutions of America to be able to get more power. Now, would it be useful to have a whole new country, an independent country? Yes, but. In, in the world of, you know, military transfers of military technology to local police, in the world of the strategies of violence against the Republic of New Africa, right, I, I need to understand the clear argument that folks are arguing about, like, pure separatists. Like, where do we separate from? Like, do we separate on Indian land? Do we separate on the continent? So in a world where people are existing in this context, what strategies can we use to actually give folks some space where they can make money that isn't tied to like a white funder being able to cut it so it's like having a job where you can actually like do politics because you're not afraid you're going to get fired for doing politics because that's one of the unspoken assumptions of like you know um these nonprofit industrial complex jobs is that you're tied to your funder but yeah i mean the scale is the big thing because yeah you can do a building here or there you can flip a few houses you know and you can claim to be getting money from black people that pay you rents but then you're subject to housing law. Then you're subject to tax law. Then you're subject to all of these things in America. Are you just going to not pay your taxes? You know what I mean? So you can try to do, you know, what's spatially, you know, a pure black business independent strategy. But it always comes back to you. We are captives in a state that we were forced to come to. Like None of our ancestors, unless you're, you know, an African immigrant, chose to come to America voluntarily. So in the midst of that forced vol involuntary transport of African people to America, how do we use the resources of our ancestors, which they have done, to be able to correctly interpret how to create organizational formations that give us the best shot to push back against this violence and build something that at least gives us the space to feel a sense of humanity in the face of it? And then you have to look at the examples of the Black arts movement. You have to look at the examples of you know, the Black Panthers, but you have to look at them cohesively. And you have to look at things like... Um, you know, Bobby Seal, uh, based, you know, basically being, you know, more of a grassroots, independent black nationalist, but he doesn't get talked about the way Huey does because Huey held this communist rhetoric, right? <laughs> oh yeah, the the writing is on my Facebook page. It's really just my personal feelings. I was just gonna say the link is in the it's in the link the, is it's the in link the, is in the chat in the show and notes right below. Yeah, I, so, I'd yeah. like to have some time to actually flesh out more of the analysis. You know, so again, this is just my personal feelings, and I felt it was just too jarring for me to not say anything. But yeah, I'd like to write something more formal that takes this feedback into account and then be able to maybe to publish that and continue this conversation. Because again, I feel like what happens is that these arguments happen on different registers, where I'm talking about, again, the fact that funders are reading the book and what they're taking from it, while so often the conversation just wants to focus on, you know, specific paragraphs and specific language. I think the book needs to be taken as a totality. And that's not how we're trained to think about these texts, right? I think the academic framework is, you know, this is specifically what I wrote, this is specifically what I will defend. If people are interpreting that this way, I'm not accountable for that. And I just think that there are decisions made in this book that seem to me that the book is clearly written in a way that wants to be interpreted that way. Now, whether that's the editor, whether that was like what you gotta do to like, get the book deal? It's like, I don't know. I'd like to know, right? Because I see this in a lot of texts. This is the last thing I'll say. I know we're running out of time. Is this is happening in Black scholarship all over the place. Like this is my, you know, part of my critique of Kendi is that we have people who can give specific nuggets of information that are useful. But then for some reason, they start wildly opining about particular authors, particular ideas, particular concepts. And it's usually Black nationalism. Pan African nationalism and some black independence in some way, shape, or form. So we have folks who are trying to learn and do better. You know, well meaning folks, maybe they work at a nonprofit, maybe they're a funder, maybe they're a teacher, a professor, 
trying to learn and do better. And it's very clear to me that not just Marissa, so this is not unique to her, but that part of this new industry of anti-racist publishing, there is a clear tendency to consistently question, disregard, make seem childish, or sometimes directly attack anything that deals with the history of Black independent political organizing, Black African sovereignty, with very rare exceptions, right? So this is really what I want to get to. I don't have the time to write all the book critiques of everything I read, right? But the fact that this is circulating in so many spaces, I think make this a good starting point, what I think needs to be a larger conversation as to what is the politics of this new, you know, and again, you've done this on your uh, platform and Black Heart Media is doing this, but what is the specific political implications of this large anti-racist term? What is the political implications that lead to things like the Build Back Better bill, right? Because I think that the trajectory of anti-racist publishing leads to things like that being seen as acceptable. And again, the only critique that I hear is that it's not big enough. That's my argument. My critique is not that it's not big enough. It's that we have to look seriously at the ways in which you can redo the policy, you can change the policy, what's in the assumptive logic of what they fund and what they don't fund. What do they call an evidence-based practice? Who are they funding to do technical assistance? Who are they funding to actually roll out the construction of these buildings? And at every single level, it seems to be not us. <laughs> and so that, that's robbing us of critical space to have actual streams to begin to build Black independent infrastructure. And even if you don't feel that way, that that's valuable. The alternative is white folks are going to control all of our civilizational infrastructure for drug treatment, for everything. And it's largely because I think well-meaning people are reading these books and they think this is the only thing that works. And this is, this is worth doing even if the cost is Black independence. Because Black independence, as they've read in books like this, is like, you know, not where it's at per se. Right. Well, so yeah, I, I, I mean, want to I, fundamentally I, intervene in that scholarly trajectory because I see the political violence that's coming from it. I'm I'm not always sure what the intent is for for any author. I think, consciously or not, uh, it's it's made clear that you know certain politics are not rewarded and some are. So I don't think Marissa is coming out of a particularly partic a particular radical, certainly black radical tradition. So she's not going to have. A uh, certain focus, and and that focus that she does have is going to be well rewarded. Uh, so, you know, whether she intended to do that or not, I don't know. Um, I don't necessarily care so much. Uh, yeah. But, but at the same time, the 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 trick bag, so to speak, that I keep coming back to is this question of uh, uh, of independence of, um, and by the way, I'm not rushing you. We have, you know, we have time unless you need to go. Uh, uh, I got case. like uh, 15 more minutes. Okay, all right, well then let me just, okay. So let me just say this then. Um, the, the question for me is less, I'm more interested in black organized politics than I am in black ownership of any particular business or industry. I'm more interested in the wealth that is generated being redistributed appropriately without it requiring a particular involvement of uh, uh, ownership or um, uh, so now so if if so that's why I'm and that's why I'm less interested in, in and then so that's one part. The other part is the capacity, the potential, so, for instance, you use construction as an example. The 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 funded construction project, the projects that would be funded through a, a Build Back Better or some other infrastructure structure program, there aren't enough big enough black owned construction yeah. companies to take those contracts. So we could say, well, you have to hire more you black construction workers uh you have to you have to whatever 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 but my thing would be the the um wealth that is created be distributed so that it doesn't require that there be black construction company owners or yeah. even black construction workers for black people to benefit from the wealth yeah. distributed and created from that construction yeah. for uh, or benefit so, but um, anyway, and what take I'm any, any time you want to say anything. We you really want to say. have a really messed up choice. And again, mm -hmm. 
this is just not just me as a reader, but as a person who is doing policy advocacy on things like reparations for the war on drugs, cannabis tax revenue. You know, with the cannabis tax revenue, I begin originally said, I don't want to focus on the business at all for cannabis because that's just rich people getting richer. I only want to focus on tax revenues. And what happened was that my community wouldn't let me do that. For better or worse, they demanded that we have a stance relative to some spaces for legitimate Black entrepreneurial opportunity. So as a metric of me being accountable to my community, I had to think, okay, I'm not going to talk about the cannabis growers per se, or even the dispensaries, because that's millions of dollars in capital. But there are strategic spaces where folks further down the chain can put together capital and scrape together and have that opportunity. I need to talk about that. So it's a metric of me being accountable to my community. Folks were saying, look, I'm not saying that we're going to be the P. Diddy of, of, of cannabis, but I don't want to take a grant to do workforce development. I don't want to take a grant to do youth development. I want to run a business. And you are accountable to the community. Help me do that. So I think that's the reality is that it really is a binary choice, unfortunately, between some folks who want to do entrepreneurship and some folks who want to get access to the other streams of redistribution through the pipelines available to us now. Right. And that it's a legitimate choice in terms of which form of violence you want to deal with, the violence of the market or the violence of government funding the nonprofit industrial complex. And there are a lot of working class black people who either can't because they didn't go to college, they don't have the access or won't get access to the opportunities for redistribution that are available to us now. Right. So they need access to I got strong a body. I can build stuff. So those are also the people who are often most adjacent to the street economy causing violence. So again, people are demanding us, as again, um, Bobby Seale said that as much as they talk about the Panthers being a vanguard organization, I'm not comparing us to the Panthers per se, they talk about the Panthers being perceived as a communist vanguard organization. But in his book, he says, we are a people's organization and we generally go where the people ask us to go. So if the people are asking us, demanding that we take seriously working class black people who are adjacent to the street economy, who are not gonna get access to the service economy, who can't wait for us to pass a universal basic income, who can't wait for us to pass a universal jobs guarantee, they need something to keep them alive now. And I'm saying that if we had had scholarly texts that were less dismissive of minority set-asides, when they passed that $1 trillion, it's already passed, done, cooked, bipartisan infrastructure deal, folks like us who were making this argument five years ago could have had more sway and being like, look, I don't want no handouts to the SBA. I want a mandate to fund some black contractors so they can get the capacity to build larger projects. Because this is what happens. We don't focus on building the capacity. So every time funding comes down the pipeline, they cannot fund us because they can say we don't have the capacity. Right? And I'm saying that it's because of scholarly texts like this, which again, do not say all oh, the SBA was ridiculous, but they say, meh, you know. It makes it but hard. See, so, it makes it very so, difficult. Like when I'm in Black Lives Matter adjacent circles, I'm raising this conversation. I'm raising this trick bag, and they say things like what Melissa says. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that's cool, but that's not really where it's at. You know, fight the power, universal basic facing income. You know, revolutionary socialism. And I have to go back to Baltimore, and people are saying, look, I've seen it happen. I've seen a decade where we had better results because of this program. And again, ideally, we'd have an alternative where they have a university, universal basic income or something like that. Or we had a jobs guarantee that we controlled, so they wouldn't need that. But right now, we don't have the civilizational infrastructure to move to be able to See, make hundreds of thousands of jobs outside of the vehicle. Yeah, the vehicle which is too. why I keep saying, so this is why, and this is the part where, I, I, again, where I like my reading of Marissa's work. Because I'm saying, I don't care what, her conclusions are she has already proven or, or or added yet another layer of proof to the fact that black banking black business black entrepreneurialism black capitalism doesn't and cannot work so what we need is some 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 uh uh uh, uh political power and to mm -hmm. tap in to that gdp that's how i interpret it yeah. so my question my point would be slightly different from yours why wouldn't we be advocating Black people organized politically, not to get a redistributed SBA contract to a black business, but to say, to, to bypass all of that and say, none of that works 
so so I'm not so I'm even confused. So so yeah. Again, so define the, the, the political real quick. The political lens people are bringing to Baradaran's work maybe maybe more of the problem than her work itself. Because when I'm coming away with her book, I'm saying I don't want to have an argument about money going to another black business because even mm -hmm. the best intended black business cannot help the black community. So what I'm saying is the political thing should be any wealth, like again, Frank White on a national level. If a nickel bag is sold in a park, I want to cut. If money is being made in this country, yeah. I want my community to get a cut. I don't care if I own a business. I don't care if I work in the business. I'm a member of this damn country by will or choice or whatever or, or imposition and mm -hmm. therefore when wealth is made i want to cut so that means it doesn't require an infrastructure bill or a black business bill or 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 whatever bill it require it just it, anyway on that level so if it's if it's construction we don't have enough black construction companies to be big enough to do the big enough work to da 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 so we just say so so i would my argument would be nationalize the construction industry any construction job gets redistributed and, and it's the wealth it creates back to the communities so or, you know that kind of thing i don't know yeah all the yeah details, I, I, I don't think they're necessarily mutually go ahead i think the assumption is that these arguments are mutually exclusive and what i'm saying historically is that they actually have been less so than I think it's been perceived. That was the point about the minority contractors teaming up with the Black Panthers to demand more radical policies. Because yes, as they are in the status quo, I'm definitely not arguing that Black businesses have to scale to solve all of America's problems. What I'm saying is that if we have to have political spaces to have independent Black organizing, to be able to leverage any of these policy changes, how are those spaces supported and funded? And unfortunately, we have very few choices. We have the foundation world, we have the government, and we have independent black business. And what I'm saying is that when we cut off one of those choices, the choice that, frankly, I think in the status quo, most work, more working class black people have access to directly, then we are limiting our ability to have a comprehensive strategy of points of attack to leverage attacks on the system. Because again, and again, also why I would just really, really question you is that when you say every nickel I want to cut, what they hear is build back better. That's what I fear is happening. I know that's not what you're saying, but I'm, you're, you're on mute. You're on mute. I know that's not what you're but saying, that's, but what that's, increasingly that's what I think. But that's my hearing, point. And that's what I want to challenge. But that's my point. I'm not interested in what they're hearing. I'm interested in what we're hearing and what we're organizing around. Because once that is clear, yeah. then we will make them hear what it is we need them to hear the way we need them to hear it. That's yeah. that's what that's ultimately. So the last thing I just want to ask, because you, you said you only had a couple more minutes, but I did want to ask a lot of a lot of uh, of your argument in general comes from your deep engagement with community in Baltimore and beyond. How is your argument informed by your direct and LBS's direct engagement with black people in Baltimore, the, the, the so-called black uh, uh, grassroots community that, that you talked about? Um, yeah. well, throughout. And, and that's kind of why I wanted to bring in the example of cannabis legalization. We are working on cannabis legalization in Maryland. It's gonna pass next year. So if folks who wanna have like actual spaces for black empowerment in that legalization process, please hit us up, lbsbaltimore.com. And again, that's part of why I started brought, I probably should have started with that. Because again, I came to that with the only focus on the tax revenue, basically on what you were on. It's like, y'all gonna do your capitalist stuff, whatever. We need to have bits and pieces of that to redistribute into, into the community. And what I realized was again, that does not have the scale to fully be reparations for the war on drugs. I totally concede that. But it begins to seed independent black political spaces if and only if we have just as much stark, deep focus on that money going to actual grassroots Black people, as I've seen talked about in like, you know, the national media spaces around, you know, more national politics. What I fear, again, because of people's feelings about books like the Rhymes, we don't have a deep study and belief and focus on the nuances of funding Black institutions. Because I can get that $100 million pot of money, tax revenue, but if we don't actually understand who it has to go to, what, how it's going to get co-opted, then we're gonna get, you know, redistributive policy that ends up feeding the white nonprofit industrial complex. It's gonna turn people in my community against the stuff I'm saying, against the man, you should have focused on getting the bag with the businesses because they, they messed up the redistribution of tax revenue. So what I realized, I have to do both. I have to do both. I have to at least bring my expertise 
that exists because the community supports me to, to reflect what they feel is that at least if I'm selling weed to black people, I'm accountable to my black customers. I have to pay taxes and I have to live in America and that sucks, but we can use some, some businesses, not all, but some can use that independent space outside of the government funding cycle. My God, getting government contracts is so terrifying. I'm definitely not claiming that as a solution for everything. But when you have that government contracting cycle, it is difficult. It's, it's very difficult. And when you have the nonprofit grant cycle, it's very difficult. And mm. independent businesses are difficult as well. But when you're accountable to black customers, you at least have the possibility and you're not tied down by 501c3 status to be like, hey, that's, that's the councilman as well. I can use my money for my business to launch a campaign against them. And that's legal. Right. So Lawrence, as a business, I have to be able to leverage some of that political power. And that's what people in the community are telling us. So, again, we have to do both. We have to focus on the tax revenue, the redistribution of those big white capitalist cannabis dollars and hear the community's demand to be able to leverage entrepreneurship as a survival space and as a base of political possibility. All right. This is the only thing I have left. And actually, maybe the only thing I have left is a, a legitimate interest at this point. Who in Maryland is preparing to develop a vegan, an infused vegan delivery <laughs> menu? Yeah, I got five on it. I want yes. to invest. <laughs> that is one black owned business I want to be a part of an infused Absolutely. vegan delivery full menu service. Exactly. And, that, and if we that, want that, that covers the whole Maryland from Howard County. Well, at least from Baltimore to Howard County. <laughs> yeah. And if we want that, we need to get the policy right. We got to be able to incubate some small black, some small businesses, because otherwise it's going to be vegan edibles brought to you by, you know, uh, MedMen, the big, the big international cannabis conglomerates. Right. So, again, having that focus on small scale growers. And even again, it's like you can open a head shop and sell glass and make tons of money without ever touching the plant. You can open a cannabis event space and, and buy, you know, uh, uh, a warehouse and renovate the warehouse. So this is not only for black millionaires. But again, that's where I'm focused. I'm focused on the space where, you know, you can cobble together a couple hundred thousand dollars and at least take your shot. Right. Because that's what people told me to focus on. So, yeah, I hear what you're saying. That's why we go into the weeds of these policies sometimes, because you need to figure out, like, who's incubating that? You know, is that a cooperative? How do we incentivize a cooperative? What forms of economic cooperation can actually work in this space? You know, how do you actually take seriously the capital mm. limitations? You know, these are all questions that, again, we have to take seriously. And that's what I fear sometimes is that because we become so revolutionary, that these mundane, nuanced questions of institutional formation get pushed a little bit. They seem as boring. You know, they seem as kind of, yeah, whatever. And what I'm saying is that unless we actually take seriously a specific focus on the craft of building black institutions, it all just kind of feels like Charlie Brown's parents talking. And then we get sidetracked into, you know, these more abstract, larger conversations that yes, can solve the violence at scale. But what we're arguing is that being able to invest in an infrastructure of these institutions working together gives us the political base to begin to be able to launch some of those larger scale campaigns. You know, so yeah, so again, this is a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I'd love to have some time to, you know, sharpen my thoughts and maybe come back, uh, maybe around Build Back Better oh, wait, or something man. else. Yeah, man. I mean, look, look like I said, man, I, I, we can't get it all right in one conversation. I love these discussions. Uh, I really appreciate the work you and LBS are doing. So you're welcome back anytime. And uh, obviously, there will be many more opportunities to have this discussion because I am looking around the corner and I don't see the revolution. So, it looks like we're gonna have a little bit of time to, to get back to all this. So anyway, Lawrence Grand Prix, thank you very much. Anytime you're welcome to come back. We look forward to more and uh, we, we'll bid you adieu and, and come back and wrap up the show. But thank you very much, my man. Appreciate all right, take it you. easy, peace. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, everybody. Uh, again, I really appreciate Lawrence for coming through. I appreciate all of you coming through. Uh, I want to, I'm going to straight up uh, 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 an offer. Um, I'll apologize. I think it's an apology worthy. I think that the, um, my initial discussion uh, at the beginning of the show of that crypto story and Elon Musk uh, was not worthy of this program or platform. So I will uh, check back into it and come back and, and look to get into that on Friday uh, when we come back when I mix what I like live again with Brother Kaaba uh, and get into some 
who knows what else but but let's put crypto back on the list in fact let me let me let me get it put it right back up here right now um uh, i have a couple of minutes i will if, if folks have a comment or a question they would like uh to address with me in the next couple of minutes please do go ahead and put it up in the in the chat again um and uh um and I'll see if we can get to it for a couple of minutes. Uh, I do also want to um, oh, right. there were there was something else very quickly. So forgive me again. I cannot remember who was encouraging me to check it out, but somebody was asking me if I would watch uh, Amina, um, the the Netflix uh, series or or film um. Amina, and let me get the full title here real quick because I didn't finish it, but I did start it, and I and 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 I had an initial thought, <laughs> um, and in fact, in my notes, uh, uh, yeah, it's just called Amina. Okay, there is no subtitle. Okay, I was looking for the whole title. All right, um, and I would I would show you, but but Netflix doesn't even let you, you know, share the screen. They're that gangster with their sharing of the screen. Um. But my initial thought about it was uh, that it's perfect for Netflix. Um, and it's in that it's a, a Henry Louis Gates approach to uh, the to African history and the sto st story of an African community. Uh, and I say that to say that that uh, they're clearly making the point that all of the enslavement that uh, African people uh, in this at least story suffered, you know, was solely in an in, in intra-African experience. Again, it's not to deny that Africans enslaved other Africans. It's not to deny it's to suggest it was some perfect utopia. But but you know, if all the stories that Netflix would choose to tell about African history, uh, I'm not surprised at all that one of them prominently featured would be one that that solely uh at least as far as i've seen maybe they do something at the end that's quite a dramatic shift so i'll keep watching but uh but initially that was my thought you know like it's 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 what everything henry louis gates would want us to see in an african a film about african people in history africans abusing other africans so you know okay i mean you know Again, it's not that it wasn't real, but uh, 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 yeah, and all of them, all the streaming services uh, are pretty gangster with it. I learned that in in, in all this uh, virtual uh, classroom stuff, uh, they get really, really gangster. Um, but you know, so anyway, it, again, so so after the initial visual, like I. It, I mean, obviously it doesn't have the budget that, you know, whatever, but, but I, I was like, you know, again, I, I always love that on the one hand, I thoroughly enjoy not seeing Europeans in a movie about Africans. And it's one of the rare movies about Africans that actually features Africa and African people, as opposed to, you know, all the Madagascars and, and, you know, white savior films and all of that where african people either aren't there or aren't featured or are just you know cartoon animals um who said i don't think a ubi is a silly idea um again it's the same thing if 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 a universal basic income would convince people that capitalism is good, America is good, that slavery was worth it, that imperialism is is okay, that that because we're all getting a guaranteed income, the way that the wealth we you know we're we're benefiting from is generated is should be without question. If 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 that's the trajectory we're headed in, then obviously it's a net negative. If the trajectory is the other direction, that as a path to an improved world, we start with a redistribution and an institutionalized redistribution of the wealth we create to help people. Um, that's great. Again, Dr. King and Richard Nixon both advocated for a UBI. I, so, and again, they're going in different directions. Nixon is saying, let's give you money so we can get them to calm down, shut up and, and, and get on board with capitalism and white 
America. King was, let's have this be on a pathway to socialism. So I don't I don't think it's a silly idea at all. And again, to me, because it refocuses on everybody on that, you know, trite, often reduced to a trite phrase of equal equality of outcome, not of opportunity. I don't care about equal opportunity. I want equal outcome. Uh, so that would be. Hey, straight up, that's what I'm trying to do here. That's why I even, not, not Lawrence notwithstanding, he does not fall in this category, but that's why I even want to invite people that don't agree with me and maybe don't even like me as if that was possible. I mean, imagine that. But yeah, no, I think we need much more. We, we need much more. We need much more. And I do think just to, just to big up our, our what we're attempting here at BPM, I don't see that on a lot of other platforms within a certain range of discussion. There's not, they don't, there's, there's not a lot of debate. There's not a lot of difference in opinion. Um, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> ah, interesting. So again, that's my point. So, so again, the same thing. If the argument around a UBI would be to, to, to pull us in the rightward direction, obviously that wouldn't be my point. My point would be UBI is more proof of how much more the state should be doing, given particularly all the wealth it creates. So I wouldn't, again, it wouldn't be for me an either or. It wouldn't be to say, well, let's cut Social Security so we can have a UBI. No, we should have Social Security. We should have a UBI. We should have national health care. We should have all types of stuff. Um, and I did just, honestly, and I don't think I've ever focused on it this way, but, but as much as we talk about the military budget should be reduced, I, it didn't even occur to me that the military is exempt from all policies this country engages in terms of climate change. I didn't know that until I think this past weekend should have known that it makes sense. But so the idea is, so how are you going to reduce carbon emissions? Again, I just remember on my ship. This is in the night. I left in 1993. So in early 1990s money, my one ship, one ship spent one million dollars every day just on gas. And that's 1990s dollars. That's one ship. So if they're burning a, a million a day in fuel on one ship, and never mind, and I participated in this, I'm guilty of this because I was told to take out the trash. When you go to the back of that ship and just dump that trash, even then, before any real politics or environmentalists, whatever, I was, I remember vividly dumping the trash and looking at it, looking at the ship at all of the trash, this miles long of trash we would be leaving behind the ship miles long and i'd be thinking this probably is not good <laughs> this is probably not reconcilable but so i you know if they're exempt i don't even know so yeah i don't know i don't know obioma is correct where is that oh uh, is this where she's correct the military big yeah man i mean you, everybody i don't mean to uh, that's exactly what UBI Yang is pushing. Cut social spend. Oh no, is that what Yang is doing? Oh no, 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 no. Word, Jordan. Hey, right on. Big ups to Jordan. Um, who 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 was responsible for all of this? Um. And I'll say it again. I, I mentioned at the beginning, it's not just I mix what I like, but but all of BPM's shows are starting to move over uh, in audio to uh, uh, all of your favorite podcasting spots, if that helps you tune in. So to that end, we don't just want you to become members, financial or supporters or otherwise of the YouTube channel. Uh, but please do hit us up at Patreon. And really just to get to all of that, go to blackpowermedia.org. Uh, and you can find everything you need in terms of all the shows, when they'll be, where they are. You can sign up there, subscribe there, find our Patreon there, become a supporter there. You can do all of that there. 
Um, there's more expansion coming, by the way. We have, you know, the the Brokish podcast has joined us. The sisters from from Brokish are now joining us, and they'll be uh, coming on more fully in the in the in the in the so called Gregorian New Year. <laughs> um. Uh, other folks, other other shows coming, other expansion projects we're trying to do. There's a lot we're, we're, we're really trying to continue to do. And I know sometimes for me, it feels like we're moving at a glacial pace. It's not fast enough, but uh, uh, we really are trying to, 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 to put it in here. And, and again, we just humbly remind everybody that, that uh, everybody working with BPM is doing this as a side addition to all of our day jobs, so to speak. So um, everybody is is involved with millions of other things so we're all I, th I think doing a great job and the best we can so far and trying to get better and and jordan is 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 um uh, helping out with that for sure and uh yeah i mean and so yeah we are expanding there as well um what else what else anything else what else is going on uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Uh, everybody from Dr. King to Nixon to Milton, you know, Chicago University, uh, uh, Chicago School of Economics, neoliberal, uh, you know, boy, oh boy. And did you all know? that the late Haynes Johnson, who used to remind us in grad school uh, all the time that he had written multi, you know, umpteen books and that he and his father were the, at the time, I don't know if it's happened since, the only father and son Pulitzer Prize winners and that he was a legendary civil rights journalist, white boy that went to the South and covered the, covered the civil rights. And he came to, and, 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 and boy, did he not like having me in his, graduate classes and boy was milton friedman a topic of one of our most heated debates because he didn't think that his lowly students would be actually reading capitalism and freedom and come into class ready and he actually didn't think i understood what 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 the late friedman said meant by liberal economics and and at, I believe it was after this class because Haynes Johnson, boy oh boy, boy oh boy, he's he we got you know so I let him know I used to I I bring this up as often as I can because this was one of my favorite things to do I used to intentionally, and I used to come in like this just like this, so we would be assigned all of these readings and I would actually go out and get all the books and I would actually be doing all the read I like was reading like I was I was I was the the super student I really was like overdoing it, reading everything, reading the footnotes, going to the library and finding everything. So I would come into class with a stat and I would sit intentionally right next to him at the end. So he would sit at the head of the table and I would sit. So if I was where I am now, he would be like, he would be like right here. And I would, and I would sit with my stack of books plop him down and sit there. And then he would always go the other way. Like I, we, it was like a routine because he didn't want, because once he saw that I came prepared and wasn't scared of him and, and was happy to disagree with him. And I think prove him wrong weekly. Uh, he would go the other way. So he would set it up so that the discussion would always start in the, in, in the opposite way and come to me at the end. So he could, you know, at least put me off to the end. And after this one class about Friedman, I was like, look, I know Friedman's work. I know what he means. Johnson pulls me up. He calls me up. Let's, he stops class. Let's go upstairs to my office. We go up to his office and he says, why are you here? I'm just getting a PhD in journalism. Uh, you know, um, that was the first question verbatim. I don't remember the, everything else verbatim. He, then he proceeded to ask me, but you're not trying to be a journalist. What are you trying to do? I don't want to be a journalist. I'm a critic. I'm an activist. I'm, I'm, you know, and as I talked, said on the, when I was interviewed the other day on real talk with Dr. Sundiata, I never shared that part of the story either. I I was only in the PhD program in journalism because Dr. Burroughs got me in there, hooked me up 
didn't hook me up, put me in touch with one of the, the faculty there that he he knew and liked. And, and, and she helped me get in, uh, Dr. Maureen Beasley uh, uh, and the late Dr. Uh, um, uh, 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 Kathleen McAdams, two white women from the South who were the only, like the, the, the loudest, most aggressive defenders of mine and, and Dr. Burroughs and a few other uh, uh, radical voices in those spaces. It was a wild, contradictory time. The black woman that was there at the time, I can't say snitched on me because I hadn't done it. She falsely reported on me and got me got my finances suspended while I was there. That's how contradictory it was. And the white women were supportive. The white Southerners who remembered how all those white men treated them and took that into their defense of everybody else. That was deep, actually. It was very deep. It was very deep. And the colonized the sister spoke against me because she didn't have that white privilege and had spent her whole career in professional journalism and academia struggling to get to her lofty place and wasn't going to have this, certainly. And then, of course, she was as light as me. Mm, that, 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 that. We can't, you can't be as beige as me and be representing that black radicalism I've been running away. That was my interpretation of it. That was my interpretation. But she sure enough did concocted a whole story and went to the, to the two white boys at the top and got my funding cut. And I only learned because I was cool with the sisters that worked in the, in the, in the, the secretarial pool or the, the office staff pool. Uh, um, uh, and I came in one day to the mailbox. Was like, what's up? They were like, "What are you still doing here?" I said, "What?" And they said, "We filed your your the termination of your funding, so we figured you left." I said, "That's how I found out. That's how I found out." Anyway, and little Haynes Johnson sat up in there, boy. He wasn't little. He was actually a big dude, but he said, but he was little, and he sat up in there and tried to intimidate me out of the program. And at the end of the day, had to put an A on the transcript. Because everything and, and A on everything I submitted, because there was nothing he could do other than say he disagreed with me. And I wish he would have. Um, and I even checked with the university. Can they falsely grade me based on a political disagreement? I had everything fine. Anyway, it was it was wild. It was wild. So, yes. That's what I think of every time I hear, you know. I don't even know what you're talking about, but it just is. Um, daily burst of sanity. What's oh? What's the difference between a UBI and the debt jubilee you talk about? Well, as I understand it, a UBI universal basic income would be: uh, you turn eighteen, you get you know eighteen hundred, two thousand dollars, and whatever it would be, two thousand dollars a month, guaranteed, no matter what, regardless of your employment. So if you have a job, you still get it. You don't have a job, you still get it. Uh, and it's not a tremendous amount of money, but something to make it supposed to be make it make it easier for people to survive without, as Dr. King put it, resorting to other dangerous, hostile, even illegal activity. A debt jubilee just simply would mean all your debt would be canceled. And my point would be every single thing. The only caveat I might offer is for cars. And it would depend. So for instance, but 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 and, and I went through a whole thing on that before, but I, I don't even want to cancel that. Just all debt, period. So you could say, you know, and if you wanted to make it so people couldn't run off and start accumulating new debt now, you could say every debt, every penny of debt you've accumulated before November 15th, 2021 is wiped out. Credit cards, rents. Well, not rent, I guess, because you're not, that's not a debt technically. Mortgages, cars, student loans, credit cards, anything, any, any debt would be wiped out. And the reason why I tend to like that more, if, if, if we're forced to choose, the way I like that more than even a cash payout, even for a reparations move. The reason I like that better then is is that if you are given money but still have a lot of debt, obviously you're still poor. Um, if you're given a lot of money and still have a lot of debt, 
um, you, 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 you're still beholden. So, so I, I would rather have no money coming in, but not owing any money. Um, now really it should be a debt Jubilee and a UBI and a cash payout and all kinds of things in terms of reparations or just correcting the inequality that we suffer to this day. Um, and it looks like, um, slowed here anyway it's 10 o'clock i should be moving on anyway but uh, uh i hope that answers the question i hope that came through clearly enough because it looks like i'm lagging a little bit sorry for that haynes johnson detour but whew. um yeah i started watching passing too by the way i didn't get too far um but i am very interested in it and uh and it's been a long time since I read, we read Passing and Quicksand were often offered together. Um, I would be interesting to know what people think. And again, especially because thinking that, that again, this is about 10 years old now, but that study that, that I remember that came out about so-called mixed folks was saying that the tendency now is for more mixed folks to pass as black, as fully black than to try to pass as white. So I don't know if that's an issue of just what is capable or a political preference, a, a shift of sorts. I don't know. All of that works too, by the way, for me. Yeah, I like that word too. <laughs> Cause you feel it would be like a Jubilee, like, right? you know what I mean? Like, like, man, can you imagine? Oh my goodness. Just the student loan debt alone. If they just, if they just, uh, Hold up, what you confused about, Ursa? What you confused? Um, yeah, nah, man. Yeah, this is, we need more social services, not less. Anyway. Listen, good people. We'll 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 keep. I'll I'll, I'll keep an eye on on. Uh, uh, um, I'll, I'm, I will check passing and finish Amina, uh, and, and maybe we can come back to some of that as well. Please do come back tomorrow morning for more Boom Bat Breakfast on the Remix Morning Show when everybody reconvenes and all throughout the rest of the week. I'll be back on Friday with Brother Kaaba. There's a lot of other great content out there that I and others have produced that you might have missed that you should always go back and check out. Please do share, like, share, subscribe, click that join button, uh, click the bell to make sure you get your notifications and all that good stuff. And uh, if you're hearing this on all of the expanding platforms that we're, we're moving to, uh, your, your, your favorite podcast platform, please do go to blackpowermedia.org and make sure you're subscribed there and support our Patreon as well. Uh, and help us continue to grow. So thanks, everybody. If I didn't get to it, I do check them. So like the good folks and Pierre over at Comedy Hype. If Put you, it in the comments. If you got more to say, and like Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody. Catch you next time. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.